Welcome to the Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it's great to be with you. Today, we are going to be talking about spiritual independence. And right off the bat, I want to say that this term may or may not describe the people that we're talking about, because I think that it's hard to maybe land on one particular term. Uh, some people might identify as spiritual, but not religious, uh, spiritual eclectic, spiritually fluid, uh, deconstructing faith, disaffiliated, nuns, um, N-O-N-E-S, not Catholic people who wear habits. <laughs> Anyway, whatever you want to call that, this is a growing demographic. And I would say that in the past couple of years, as I've been companioning with people, I'm finding more and more people who identify with this category of spiritual independence are finding their way into the contemplative. And it is fascinating to learn from and to hear their stories. And I think in my own life, I've had a lot of shifts as far as what it means to, I don't know, identify in this way and relate as such. Because I think traditionally, and I think that this is the case, some people may consider themselves in this category due to religious trauma or bad experiences with church. And that is a real thing that uh, is helpful to have some safe spaces to process that. I think other people just simply grow out of the whatever spiritual practices they were engaging with and are looking for something else. You know, some people I think grow up in a mixed faith household. And so if you were born into a household with a, a Hindu mom and a Catholic dad, then automatically you are maybe in this uh, particular demographic. So today we'd like just to take some time to talk about this demographic, because I think, especially for the people that I'm meeting with, sometimes you, one wonders, am I alone? Am I, is anybody else out there asking the same sorts of questions? And so we went to say, yes, you are not alone. <laughs> Many people are, but I think it's maybe hard to find those landing spots. So spiritual independence. Uh, I think demographically speaking, we're just in a hotbed of uh, people who uh, identify as spiritually independent. Uh, I think, you know, for whatever reasons, people uh, find themselves uh, landing in this demographic. Uh, you know, I think there are lo lots of reasons. You know, you mentioned spiritual trauma, a spirituality that works for you or doesn't work for you. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people grow up in certain locations in the United States, such as myself, which is the Bible Belt, and you then travel the world and you find out <laughs> that everybody doesn't believe the same thing or the same way that you do. And if you want to have positive interactions with people that are from different cultures or different faith traditions, you sort of have to have an openness to to faith, openness to others, that I think a lot of uh, our faith traditions, uh, our Christian faith traditions, uh, have not um, been open to uh, over the past uh, century. You know, there's this, this closed offness to, and this otherness to those that are from different cultures or different faith traditions. And I think uh, being in a place where cultural diversity and an openness to others has really helped open my eyes um, to this demographic and want to engage with them more. And one thing that I found that's really helpful is just this idea of discussing perennial wisdom. You know, this, I, this idea that all faith traditions have a wisdom that's universal whether it's, you know, from the Jewish faith tradition or the Muslim faith tradition, uh, I, I think it just applies across the board. And uh, I love having those types of dis discussions with others. What, you know, what we might call in, in, in religious traditions, interfaith dialogue. And I, I think to have interfaith dialogue, you have to have an openness and a hospitality to others uh, that maybe is uncomfortable until you sort of grow into this love of others probably transcends what hardline 
religious faith has has taught us over the years. I very much love that we're talking about all of this. Uh, even as I'm listening to both of you, I realize, yes, this has permeated so much of my adult life. <laughs> this trend has been going for a long time. And so the notion of where does it come from? And Christine, I really appreciate you pointing out, you might enter into this dialogue and the questions that you have and the journey that you're having for so many different reasons. I find that super helpful. Um, and Chris, I too grew up in an area that was predominantly churched in a very specific way. So I remember coming back for a visit to visit my family and being in a restaurant and overhearing people talk about this like Christian radio, this very famous Christian radio thing. And I thought, oh my gosh, I haven't overheard a conversation about Jesus in so long. But I can remember that being like the goal, right? That <laughs> the goal would be that somebody would interact with you about Jesus, even if it was just like at the checkout line. Uh, but through my adult life, this notion of having questions and am I safe to have those questions? Am I allowed to ask those questions has been a really predominant theme amongst so many people. And so for years, I feel like for one, the more that I've heard people ask those questions, I was like, hey, that is a good question. <laughs> I want to ask that question too. And also I want to create safe places for people to ask questions. So all of that has been there. And it does feel like a big journey that's been very much helped by authors and theologians who are now looking at all these faith traditions, as you guys are saying, and saying, look at this commonality and look at that commonality and this perennial wisdom stuff where I feel like as a kid, that was not my experience. It was look at this difference and this difference is making all the difference and this is why we're right. So I very much appreciate this move towards a sense of oneness and value of all people and um, value of ways in which we are the same. Yeah, and I think sometimes when we're exploring this topic, I think there's some natural maybe bracing points or uncomfortable spaces that rise up in us. And so, um, you know, I was listening to some people who were both identified as this and those that were maybe companioning that didn't necessarily identify. And what are some things that come up? And even like someone who identifies as a spiritual independent said, you know, I sometimes wonder, am I flaky? You know, I don't want to be known as someone that just picks and chooses and maybe has a shallow spirituality. I really am serious about spirituality. I crave spiritual conversations and not just the questions, but the practices and the community and growth. And so, you know, I think sometimes there are some things that maybe feel a little bit threatening to us or, uh, you know, um, Am I going to go too far in this and lose some of the things that I hold dear and true? I think there's some genuine questions that come up. And those are real and those are important to take time to explore and to go at the pace that seems reasonable and comfortable for those that are um, both companioning or maybe identify in this particular category. Yeah, I think something that I, I give a lot of thought to is like, how, how, do you, how do you have dialogue with people who are spiritually independent, spiritually curious, uh, all the ways that I've connected with people up until about three years ago has, has been through church. Um, my church experience, you know, you, you go to this, this building, you have these spiritual conversations, whether you agree or disagree uh, on what your theology is, it's, it's been the, the meeting place for those types of conversations. And, uh, you know, over the past three years, I've been having more of these conversations uh, in bars and, <laughs> you know, in, in, in gas stations. And I think it's I've learned to have short snippet conversations uh, about spirituality rather than these long drawn out conversations. But, you know, there's there's constructs that we have for for these types of conversations. And it's really hard, I think for me to have conversations uh, in church, because some of the reasons why people don't, who are spiritually independent that don't come to churches, a church just seems intellectually speaking down to anyone who would um, have a different sort of view of life. And so I found that spiritual direction, spiritual companioning is, is a much better place, a safer place, a better, better construct for having these types of conversations with people. And I really, 
uh, look forward to, to more of that type of dialogue. Because I think people that are setting out on spiritual journeys uh, to find the deeper meanings in life, I, I think God wants to meet them and, and is sort of a guide to them finding the right connections, the right people to have these conversations on their journey. I have a lot of faith in whatever you want to call the divine, that he leads people into these conversations and he leads people to these connections that are going to be super beneficial to them having a deeper, more fulfilled life through these types of conversations. Yeah, and I remember a couple of years ago, I was attending a retreat and it was a Buddhist practitioner, a Benedictine nun, and <clears throat> a Christian theologian author. And their premise was, you know what, I, as a Buddhist, as a, as a Catholic, as a um, Christian theologian, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily sway you away from your faith tradition, but the idea was, as I interact with Jesus, I become a stronger Buddhist, or as I interact with your Buddhist tradition, it actually makes me go deeper into my root and faith tradition. And I was really skeptical of that at first. I'm like, really? I don't know about that. And um, so anyway, I went to this retreat and it was really fascinating because um, whoever was presenting at the moment, the others would then interpret through their lens what that person was saying from their faith tradition. And so again, that point of the perennial wisdom, it was really fascinating to, you know, to, to, to kind of hear the di different nuances and contextualization of that. And then we had this meditation time together. And it was actually, at that point, it was the Buddhist practitioner who was doing that. <clears throat> and he was very sweet to acknowledge all of the different, you know, there was large, it was a largely Christian slash Catholic uh, population in the room. And so when he was doing his things, he said, you know, I would talk about a benevolent benefactor or guide. You can choose Jesus, you know, since, you know, many of you would, would want to be looking at Jesus, you know, for this different space. Um, so again, just very uh, generous in his leading of this time, but it was profound. I mean, it was so profound and it was, I think profound because it was different language. It was the same idea, right? It was, it was connecting to the divine, to God, but the language he used was so fresh that maybe it just kind of caught me off guard in a different way. And I sat in that, that beautiful space, having one of the most profound spiritual moments that I've had in probably a decade, if I'm honest, it was amazing. And it came from this Buddhist practitioner that was leading the session. Now, at the end of it, I had zero desire to become a Buddhist. I, you know, I appreciated their faith more, but thought, gosh, it's a lot of work to be a Buddhist. Um, I'm not used to those muscles. Um, I'm used to having kind of Jesus in, in, in my, uh, realm more so than a lot of the inner work that that Buddhism promotes, but it was so rich. And so even in my own life, I, um, again, that pace and what it means to explore and you explore as far as you're comfortable. And that's great. Uh, you don't have to go further or, or not depending on where you're at. So that's been something personally that I've been experiencing as well. I love it. And I love that there are retreats available where so you can get your one-on-one -on -one spiritual direction, or you can get this kind of group experience because both feel reasonable and important to me. Um, and even just as I hear you talking about your experience in this meditation, I think that's kind of the beauty of it is if I had stayed in this one tradition, um, for instance, like this weekend, I'm going to be talking about this notion of flowing like water, right? And I can get a little bit of that from the Bible, but I can get a really big chunk of it. Like I can kind of fill it out and understand it more when I use the Tao spirituality. So I'm spending a lot of time there this weekend to kind of flesh out more about water and and, and just kind of bring that in. It, it's not that it doesn't exist in the Bible, but as we kind of pull these together, sometimes one person had more to say about something. And so it's kind of enriching and enlivening. It's not taking away, it's not detracting, it's making it better. And, and that is a beautiful thing, but just to acknowledge that would have created a lot of shame and guilt and fear in me at one point in my life that maybe I was going to get in trouble or someone was going to be mad at me or, you know, even worse, the divine is going to, I'm going to be in trouble with this, you know. <laughs> so to be able to really sit in that space and have partnership in that space and to let go of shame and guilt and like to your point about the flakiness, like, no, I, this is enriching and beautiful. Yeah, I think something that's really helped me in this whole process is, is just the notion of, of God or the divine and and how big he truly is. I, I think if you have a small God that you try to put in this box, you try to put everybody else in that box too. And you want you want others to function within the parameters. To to say that that God or the mystical mystery 
is is much larger than I give him credit for. You tend to see that maybe some of the wisdom of other faith traditions um, can can be applied to your life, and that the divine is just as at work in other faith traditions as he is our own faith tradition. And so for me, the whole notion of the vastness of of the divine is really key to to an openness and an understanding of what we're talking about in spiritually independent or or perennial wisdom or, or whatever you want to say. I think just just an openness to the largeness and vastness of, of God. Yeah, I think in my opinion, we are on the cusp of what does it mean to engage with this growing demographic? And I think, you know, to your point earlier, Chris, traditionally we have had synagogues, churches, mosques, temples, where people would gather for these spiritual conversations in whatever tradition they were. And I think as we're changing and growing as a culture and society, we're having to come up with innovative ways for which people can gather in these different if you're spiritually fluid, eclectic, whatever term you're using, sometimes it has to be like good enough for right now. Like maybe we don't have the ideal. I feel like we're kind of in liminal space, in my opinion, of, of getting to those landing places for people. Um, but hopefully the contemplative life can offer some of that, whether it be through, you know, um, podcasts, books, retreats, one-on-one -on -one spiritual companionship, group spiritual companionship. I think that that has been such a helpful avenue for so many and would love to just continue to see that aspect grows. Thanks so much for engaging in this conversation. Uh, at this point in our podcast, we're going to share what we are into this week. So I didn't plan this at all, but the thing, <laughs> the thing that I am into right now is actually this joy diet class that I am leading slash participating in uh, where we're sort of going through this book, The Joy Diet, and there's these various menu items. So every week you add on and then we kind of share in this email thread together how it's going. So there's there's 15 minutes of just sitting and doing nothing. And then like then we added on truth telling, like what is a story I'm telling myself and what is a better story? And then this week we're, we're adding on longing. You guys, this is like changing my life. I feel like my whole world, just by way of knowing that I'm interacting with another group of people around all of this and then kind of hearing their short reflections, so meaningful, changing my life. It's great. I love that whatever you're going to be into, Christina, is going to start with the word joy. <laughs> joy diet, joy light, whatever. That's great. Uh, I think one of the things that I've been into, not necessarily, not necessarily this week as far as, you know, actively engaging with the television show, but I've really been into a show called Grandchester, uh, which is about a uh, English vicar. And uh, I think what has um, inspired me about this television series is this priest, this vicar, has such a great relationship in his community. He has a great relationship with a detective police officer and they go around sort of solving crimes because he has a great mind for uncovering mystery as well as faith. And I think what's been inspiring me about this television series is his ability to transcend the power dynamics of his role, what he does in the world and be a relational sort of connection uh, to to those that he uh, that he what we would call ministers to or is a priest to um, he sort of ha has risen above his station of priest the title and um, he has this authenticity that I find compelling as someone who sort of has to navigate power dynamics in his relationship. I really have looked to this vicar as an inspiration on how to sort of transcend these power dynamics. So Grandchester is what I've been into. Nice. Um, so I have been into Martha Beck. She is an author and has a podcast, and I'm just really finding a lot of inspiration from her life. Interestingly enough, she grew up Mormon, and I'm not sure what it is, but lately I have been running into either ex-Mormons or current Mormons, and there's a couple other podcasts that have revealed, oh, I grew up Mormon as well, and I'm just fascinated because I, I normally wouldn't have sought out Mormonism as, as a place to learn, kind of like what we're talking about today, right, with um, kind of learning from different faith traditions, um, but it's really interesting 
number one, I think hearing people deconstruct their Mormon faith, again, it's fresh language. So as I'm working with people that are maybe deconstructing our, our, you know, evangelical roots or Catholic roots or whatever, it's interesting, but also, gosh, there's just some gems that, you know, Mormon people have from their faith traditions that I'm just really fascinated by and learning from. So uh, Martha Beck is is not currently a Mormon. She um, definitely believes in the divine, um, but she'll often quote some things from her childhood that I find fascinating. So I am into Martha Beck lately. Well, as always, we're so glad that you joined us and look forward to uh, connecting again next week. In between time, if you'd like to check out the contemplativelife.net for more resources, we invite you to do so. Make it a great week. See you next time. Mm -hmm.